I invite you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. I have in your bulletin also reading Psalm 32, but we just sang it, so I didn't think that one through. So we'll just turn to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 1, and we'll read through to verse 10, and our text will be verses 8 through 10. Ephesians 2, starting at verse 1. And you are dead. In the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Are you a proud person? Are you arrogant and self-righteous? Are you full of self-importance? I don't know if I've ever met anyone except possibly a few mature Christians who are well acquainted with their own hearts who would confidently respond to that question with conviction and say, yes, I am. However, the fact is, we all know someone in our lives who oozes arrogance And everyone around them knows and sees it, and yet they themselves seem completely blind to it. And the fact is, we all like to think that we're humble. Yet the fact is, those who truly know human nature know that pride is something that has deep, deep roots in all of our hearts. And there is nothing that so exposes the pride of the human heart than when it is confronted by the message of salvation by grace alone. That, that fact is seen from the, from the fact that since it was first proclaimed in the world, it has never stopped being attacked, misrepresented, and maligned. It's a testimony of our fallen nature. It's a testimony that mankind cannot stand the thought of a salvation that, as Jonathan Edwards said, we contribute nothing to except the sin that made it necessary. We can't stand such a message in and of our human nature. Well, it's precisely this message that confronts us in Ephesians 2. Here we have set before us the clear declaration that God's salvation from first to last is by grace alone. And because it is such, it means that no one can boast. Now, before we get into this passage itself, I just want to call your mind again to the context that we've been going over the last few weeks. We notice that Paul begins verse 8 by saying, For... He's connecting what he said previously. He's he's connecting it to his unfolding argument since verse 1. And in a sense, these verses, verses 8 to 10, are are really Paul summarizing. He's bringing everything to a conclusion, everything that he said in verses 1 to 7. Now we remember in verses 1 to 3, he reminded us of how wretched, how sinful we were in ourselves outside of Christ. Then in verses 4 to 7, he showed us the action of God, the work that God himself has done, breaking into our sin and our lostness and working a sovereign salvation. And having said all that, Paul is now drawing it to a close and he's drawing the conclusion. Of course, if we have understood what Paul has already said up to this point, we could probably all draw this conclusion ourselves. 
However, Paul knows, he knows the pride, he knows the deception of the human heart, and so he wants to make very explicit what all this means. And essentially, it all centers on this. He is saying that the salvation that God has worked from first to last is entirely of grace. And what that means is that our works are put into such a perspective that we are utterly robbed of any grounds for boasting. I want to emphasize this as we, as we get, get into the passage. These are, these are very well-known verses. These are very often quoted verses. However, they are verses that drive us to look at some of the most foundational and foundational matters of biblical Christianity. The truth is, if we get these verses wrong, we have lost Christianity and we have lost the gospel. And therefore, these are verses that confront us with the searching question. Do you really understand what it means to be a Christian? Do you really understand God's salvation? Paul sets before us here three things. He shows us that salvation by grace excludes our works, that it displays God, God's work, and that it guarantees good works. So let's look at those one at a time. So first then, Paul shows us that salvation by grace excludes our works in verses 8 and 9. Look at verse 8 and 9. He says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. All over the New Testament, we find a very sharp, a very clear contrast made between salvation by grace and salvation by works. These are are two ways that we can try to be saved from sin. Two ways in which we can try to stand in God's favor and receive God's blessing. And they stand in absolute contrast to one another. They can't mix. One of them is a ladder by which by our own sweat and our own effort we try to climb up to God. The other is an elevator that comes underneath us and lifts us up where we are passive and raised up to the Lord. To be saved by grace is to be saved by the powerful working of God, doing for us what we did not deserve and what we could not do for ourselves. To be saved by works is to be saved on the basis of what we have personally done, of our own merits. It's for us to go to God and say, give me what I deserve. I'm going to earn this. Of course, these are two ways of salvation, two ways of relating to God that cannot be brought together. What Paul is doing here is he is drawing that sharp contrast. Well, let's look a little more deeply then at his positive statement about how we are saved and then at his negative statement, how we're we're not saved. Paul begins with a positive statement. By grace you have been saved through faith. So Paul is saying that the basis upon which we are saved is God's grace to us in Christ. And it's very important here that we remind ourselves that we can never separate the idea of God's grace from the Lord Jesus Christ. Because grace is the gift of God. And Christ is that gift. Christ is the one who does for us what we could not do for ourselves. Christ is the one who does for us what we did not deserve. He bore our sin. Fulfilled the law in our place. He makes us new by his spirit. And all these things come to us as a gift. And then Paul adds that it is through faith. That is to say, faith is the instrument by which we receive that grace. And so I want you to think of two two images with me, two pictures. Think of a deathly ill person lying upon a bed, and a doctor comes to give him medicine that will erase his disease and make him strong again. Now, grace is the medicine that actually comes in and overcomes the disease that is killing him. Christ is the medicine that comes in and saves us. Faith is simply the mouth that opens up to receive that medicine, to receive the grace of God. We could put it in other words. Charles Spurgeon tells the story of a a sailor who fell off a ship. And another sailor saw him fall off and he quickly ran, grabbed a rope, ran to the end of of the ship right before he passed on behind the boat as the ship was still moving. And he, he threw the rope to the man. The man latched on and he pulled him back into the boat. And after they pulled the man into the ship, they found that his, his fingers were so tightly clinging to the rope that it took them hours to pry his fingers off of it. You see, that rope is like the grace of God. 
It is what pulls us out of sin, pulls us back into the boat, back to safety. Faith is simply the hand that clings to the promise of God. Now that might seem very basic and seem, okay, makes sense. But this is so important for us to understand. It is so important to understand that faith in and of itself is not the basis of our acceptance. Faith does not merit or earn God's salvation. Faith is simply us opening up to receive. It's simply us clinging to God's promise. And a lot of people go wrong here. If you were to ask a lot of Christians and say, why will you go to heaven? A lot of them would probably say to you, because I believe. Because I have faith. We need to recognize that's not what the Bible says. Faith does not save us. It is the object of our faith that saves us. We are saved by grace. Well, at this point, uh, Paul goes on and he adds the statement and he says, and this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God. Now, there's a lot of debate here around what exactly Paul is referring to in this statement. Is he, is he referring to grace? Is he talking about faith? Is he talking about the whole of salvation? What's he talking about when he says that this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God? Well, the grammar of the passage actually makes it impossible to be absolutely certain. However, we need to remember what Paul is doing here. Paul is trying to make very, very clear that we contribute nothing to our salvation. And therefore, we have no grounds for boasting. And so in light of that fact, what makes the most sense is for him to add this as kind of a side statement. And to emphasize that even the faith that we exercise is ultimately a gift from God. And we see that confirmed in other places in scripture. You see, Paul knows how proud the human heart is. He knows how we resist humbling ourselves. And so he backs us into a corner and he cuts off, cuts off every route of escape. And he says, there is no room for smugness. There's no room for pride. There's no room for you to look at someone else and say, I am better. I did something that they didn't do. My former pastor in Woodstock once told a story in one of his sermons where he, he spoke of a time when he was working at a summer Bible camp when he was younger. And he had a number of things to say about the Bible camp. But one of the things that he said was, at one point they sung a children's song that went something like this. Jesus is knocking, knocking at the door of my heart. And then it goes on, but then at the end it says, I was smart, I let him in. You see, it's exactly that kind of attitude that Paul is trying to destroy. No, it was not your smartness. It was not something that made you better. Again, we need to go back to verse 1. You were dead in your sins. You could not even believe until God gave you life. God made us alive together with Christ, Paul says. And so we go back to that, that illustration of the sick man upon the bed, and we realize it needs to be adjusted. We weren't just sick. We were dead. So God had to make us alive. Give us the gift of faith. And then we receive his grace. And know his salvation. Well if we understand all that has been said. As Paul goes on in verse 9. And gives us the negative statement about how we are not saved. It makes a lot of sense. That is to say, if this is how we are saved, by grace through faith, then it logically follows that we are not saved by our own works. My friends, as a sinner, you cannot be good enough for God. God's law and his character demand perfect righteousness. If you want to enter my presence, you must be holy as I am holy. That is what the Lord declares. And more than that, we also recognize going back to the beginning of the chapter... We are guilty and corrupt in Adam. From our first breath we go astray. We are guilty of sin and we are children of wrath. So it's quite a remarkable thing that we can look around the world and we can find that the majority of people and even every other religion, every man-made religion holds to some form of salvation by works. And yet the fact is if we have any conception of who God is, and who we are, the idea that we can save ourselves and merit a salvation is absurd. 
Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know, could my tears forever flow, all for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. So the great result then is that no one may boast. No one can take any credit for their salvation. We are simply left to bow in humble adoration at the foot of the cross and declare salvation belongs to the Lord. To him be all glory and honor and praise. As we think about all this, I simply want to bring it home and I want to ask you, have you repented of your good works? Have you repented of your good works? Maybe you, you hear that question, you stand up startled, what do you mean? It's very, very easy for us to look out at other people and say, well, they need to repent of the evil that they've done. And I think it's easy, even fairly easy for us to look at ourselves and see the evil things, the bad things we've done, and say, yeah, okay, I need to repent of that. That makes sense to me. You see, the great stumbling block to so many, the great stumbling block of the gospel, and the great thing that so many prideful men and women cannot swallow is that the gospel calls upon us to repent not only of our evil sin, but it calls us to repent of our righteousness. It calls us to turn away from hoping in our good works and to turn to the grace of God. It calls upon us to confess that even our best works are as filthy rags when they are compared to the righteousness of God. Even our best works are shot through with sin. That includes our good works, things like our charity, our kindness, our integrity, our honesty. That includes our religious works, like church attendance, service in the kingdom, penance, Bible knowledge, or you could change the religion, the five pillars of Islam, the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. All of them are useless in making you a righteousness to enable you to stand before God. And so have you, have you repented? Have you renounced trusting in your good works and trusting in your goodness? Have you come to the place where you've stopped trying to be good enough for God? It's a very serious question. You see, God's salvation requires us to give up striving and to look to free grace. It is for us to acknowledge that we're lost Young people, have you ever done the faith fall? It's where you, you stand on a table or something, and you have a friend behind you, and you, you put your, your hands like this, and then you fall back. You're not allowed to make your foot stop you. You just got to fall back and trust that your friend will catch you. It's actually fairly hard to do. The higher you are, the harder it is. But you see, that is exactly, in essence, what we must do in salvation. We must entrust ourselves to Christ by faith. We need to stop striving, stop trying to catch ourselves, and fall into the arms of mercy. That is the way that we are saved. Have you done that? Have you believed? Have you fallen upon grace and grace alone? Well, here we have then the first mark of the true Christian. The true Christian is someone who has been so humbled before the holiness of God and the grace of God that they have renounced any hope in themselves and they've cast themselves upon grace alone. Well, Paul shows us that salvation excludes our works. However, as he goes on, he shows us that it only excludes our works in a certain sense. And so we see, secondly, that salvation by grace displays God's work. It not only excludes our works, but it displays God's work. Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now again, I want you to notice that verse 10 again begins with the word for. Again, what we are seeing is Paul is giving a further explanation to what he's just said. He's say, saying salvation is by grace, not by works. Because, you see, we are God's workmanship. See, again, Paul is drawing a contrast between our working and God's working. He is emphasizing that when we talk about salvation, we are talking about something that is God's work. 
Now, when he says that we are created in Christ Jesus, Paul is drawing a comparison between salvation and what happened at the creation of the world. We go back in the book of Genesis and we see in the creation of the world, we see God making something out of nothing. There was nothing and God spoke and everything sprang into being. It was a display of infinite power. And in numerous places in the Old Testament, we are told that creation is a display of the glory of God. It testifies to his power, to his wisdom, to his goodness, to his sovereignty. Well, the Apostle Paul throughout the New Testament repeatedly describes the work of salvation as a work of recreation. He says in 2 Corinthians, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You see, just as God spoke something into nothing in the creation of the world, so God came to wretched, dead sinners who had nothing good in themselves. And he gave them life. And he created something new. He created new life within them. And this too is a work of infinite power. And it too is a testimony to the power and the wisdom of the, and the grace of God. And so we have this image in scripture of a potter in the clay. In various places in scripture, we're told that God is the potter. God is the artist, and we are the clay. So you have a picture of a, of a potter sitting down and, and taking this mass, this lump of formless clay, and he begins to shape it and fashion it. Slowly, he works out its imperfections until it becomes something beautiful and something useful. And when you see a piece of pottery, you don't look at that piece of pottery and say, wow, what an amazing piece of pottery that it took that form. No, you look at a beautiful piece of pottery and you say, wow, that potter has talent. And so it is with the Christian. We were a mass of sin and selfishness. And by his grace, God has taken hold of us. And scripture says it is he who is working in us to will and to do for his good pleasure. See, the Christian is in the workshop of God Almighty. And he is making something. As we saw in verse 7, he's making something that he might put us on exhibition as a display of the riches of his grace. And so what is the pattern? What, it, what is it that God is trying to form us into? Well, we go back again to creation. We were made in the image of God. And by sin, that image was decimated. We lost our righteousness. We, we gave a very distorted picture of God. And we read in scripture that God in Christ is remaking us into the image of God. In short, God is making us like Christ. He's making us like Jesus. And dear Christian, do you realize that? There's the high calling of the Christian life. To be like Jesus. And if that was a work that depended on our own strength, we would be people of all, we would be of all people most hopeless. But this is the work that God is doing. It is a work again like the picture of that potter as he sits down at the wheel. And it begins in this life and he's smoothing out the imperfections so that more and more a form emerges. And that's the resemblance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And ultimately, of course, it will only be completed in the new heavens and the new earth. But that's what God is doing in you. He's making you like Jesus. You are his workmanship. And you know, whatever else that does, I know for me, it convicts me to think about how inadequate and how small my understanding of salvation is. There is no such thing as a self-made Christian. Because the true Christian from first to last is the result of the supernatural work of God doing in us what we could not do ourselves. We are his workmanship. And if we don't understand that, we don't understand Christianity. As long as we think that Christianity is merely a moral message to help us be better people, or as long as we even think that Christianity is a message of God doing 50% of the work and us doing 50% of the work so that we can be better, we don't understand the meaning of the gospel. Now the reality is that salvation is by grace alone. Which means that everything that is good in us, 
is good only because of what God has done and because, what, and because of what God is doing. And so I want to ask you, again, asking these questions. Is there an awareness in your life that God has taken hold of you in this way? Is there evidence in your life that God has his hands upon you, that he's molding you and shaping you and fashioning you? Has the work of grace begun? So you've humbled yourself and cast yourself upon righteousness, that you've turned away from sin with a resolution to walk in new obedience. And is the work being carried on? Is there a sincere desire to know the word of God? Is there a desire to learn and to grow? Are you praying that God would make you more like Christ? When God sends trials and afflictions in, into your life, do they humble you and make you cling tighter to him? These are all signs that God is at work, that God is molding and shaping and fashioning. Well, here then we have the second mark of the true Christian. Not only has the true Christian been so humbled that he has renounced all hope in his good works, but he is also one who is aware that God has taken hold of him, and therefore everything that is good in him is to be ascribed to the glory and the power of God. Now, if we stopped here, our picture of salvation by grace would be incomplete. We've seen that God is at work in us to make us something, but, but Paul goes on and he brings the conversation back home. He brings it back to us, back to how does this impact our life. And so we see thirdly, that salvation by grace guarantees good works. Not only excludes our works, it not only displays God works, God's work, but it guarantees good works. And as we come to this statement, we we recognize it forces us to clarify what I said earlier. I said earlier that salvation by grace excludes our works. However, what we see here is that our works are excluded in salvation only in a certain sense. And that certain sense is this. Our works are excluded as the basis upon which we stand before God. They're excluded as, our, as the way in which we enter into salvation. You see, we can't try to earn God's favor and acceptance. However, Paul says, having made that clear, we also need to understand that works, considered from another perspective, have to enter into our equation about what it means to be saved by grace. And that is to say that good works do not make a Christian, but a Christian, by his very nature, is someone who will do good works. And this sets something right that I think when we're left to ourselves, we always get wrong. You see, by nature, we always put works first, don't we? We always say works lead to salvation. When the Bible says, no, no, salvation leads to works. Salvation comes by free grace, and then it leads to works. And again, if we, if we don't get that, we've missed Christianity. Now here's the remarkable thing that Paul says. Paul says that we are God's workmanship. God has taken hold of us in order to make us into something. And I said earlier that the pattern that he is making us into is Christ. And that's true in a broad sense. However, we also need to understand that for each one of us individually, there is a, a specific blueprint, a unique path that God has laid out for us. And so again, go with me back to that illustration of the potter and the clay. There are a great number of things that a potter can make from a lump of clay. He can make all kinds of different things pieces of pottery, all kinds of different jars and, and pots and such things. Well, in essence, what we're being told here is that before God sat down at the pottery wheel to begin fashioning us, he had a plan in mind about what he would specifically make us to be. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Once again, we are faced with the reality that needs to leave us humbled. Every time you think about doing something good and every time you're enabled to actually carry out that good work, we recognize it's not coming from you. It's something that you are predestined to do, that God has set before you to walk in. You are simply carrying out his sovereign plan in your life. 
And so again, we're faced with two important considerations. First, this is something that needs to search us. It needs to examine us. You see, here we see that salvation by grace through faith does not lead to lawlessness. It is utterly impossible for someone who has truly received the grace of God to say, I'm saved by grace, therefore I'll live however I want. No, you see, to be saved by grace means that God has taken hold of you with the intention of producing holiness within you. The mighty power of God is at work to not only redeem, but to transform. And so we read in Titus 2 that the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, and that grace trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. You see, the grace of God is at work and it trains us. It trains us to deny ungodliness, to live zealous lives for good works. He goes on that Christ gave himself to purify a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. And so here's the searching reality that needs to confront us. Do you see that at work in you? Do you see grace at work training you? How do you know that you have received salvation by grace alone? Well, it's because your heart is inclined. Your heart is drawn. Your heart is even compelled to pursue holiness, to do good works, to live for the love of God and the love of others. And so that searches us. Have you received grace? Do you see God at work in you? However, the second thing, that we need to consider is a comforting reality. Comforting reality. See, if God has prepared good works for us before he even saved us, before he even created the world, then ultimately it's impossible that we should miss them. And I say this is a comforting reality because the true Christian is one who often faces discouragement about how slow their progress in grace is. Every Christian has times where they feel like they are not doing enough for God, when they are burdened by their weakness. You see, what we see here is that though it's a good thing, certainly, to wrestle with how do I do more for the Lord, that's a good desire. Ultimately, this can never lead us to despair because ultimately we have to come back to this. God has planned these good works for me and therefore I cannot miss them. I remember a time in my life hearing a sermon that referenced this very text. I remember the the refreshment it brought me. The Lord has always used in my life, there's always been something that he has used in my life to, to motivate me in holiness. And that is a desire to live with a purpose. As John Piper says, I don't want to waste my life. And yet sometimes that desire to not waste my life has been so discouraging. When I look at how much time I waste, how much I fall short, How much through my laziness, my unbelief, and my cowardice I fail to do. And I need to hear this sometimes. Randy, your life won't be wasted. Because ultimately God's plan for you cannot fail. He is going to guide you. He's going to discipline you. Sometimes it will be painful. But God is going to make sure that you fulfill the good works that he prepared for you. And if you are discouraged today by that, by that same reality, feeling you're not doing enough, weighed down by your weakness, then here's a comforting assurance for you. You won't miss the good works. God has them set before you. Well, here then is the third mark of the true Christian. Not only is the Christian one who has been humbled to renounce his good works, Not only is he aware that God has taken hold of him, but he also has this mighty principle of grace working in him and leading him on in the path of righteousness and obedience. As we consider this, then, we have set before us the awesome reality of salvation by grace alone. And as we consider it as a whole, I don't know about you, but one thing that stands out to me is how humbling it is And how God-centered it is. This scheme of salvation is a scheme that if man, proud mankind was left to himself, in a million years he would not have come up with it. 
It is a salvation that is only brought about by infinite wisdom, infinite power, and infinite goodness. At the end of the day, it needs, it needs to lead us to the dust at the foot of the cross to say, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss, and I pour contempt on all my pride. So may our hearts then be moved with never-ending praise to the God of grace. To him be the glory alone. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your salvation. Gracious Father, we do pray that you would humble us again before the reality of grace, that you would empty us, O Lord, of our self-importance, that you would empty us of our self-righteousness, that you would empty us of all these things, O Lord, and that you would fill us with a sight of the cross, that you would fill us with a sight of grace. And Father, we do pray that you would carry on your work in us. Thank you that you are working in us, and we pray, work so that we will walk in those good works, that we will bring glory to your name, and that we will display your grace. Father, apply your word to our hearts and bless us as we go into this week. Strengthen us by your spirit to live as your people on this earth. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I invite you to stand.